video and I had some changes in the lineup this month and I decided uh, to invite some people to come on the first segment and they weren't able to make it so I didn't fight it. Today we're only having two segments and we're going to do them back to back. So um, the first segment is going to be the Relentless Food for Thought segment where we always talk about something to think about which today is designing um, a life that works. And um, then later um, we're going to be talking with Dan Bill Dambrova at, at, uh, at, in just a little bit actually at 2.45. No, three at three ten. So I only have ten minutes to talk to you. So let me talk to you about this idea of designing a life that works. Um, I'm a firm believer that work is so important, and that you should be doing something with your life that you actually enjoy and you feel is is meaningful. Um, you shouldn't just be showing up for work every day and just dreading working. Um, I've been reading Miracle Morning every morning, and uh, my reading this morning really was in alignment with what I thought about talking about today. And one of the things that talked about was if you're waking up in the morning and hitting the snooze button a lot and just dreading getting out of bed and you throw your legs over the bed and you sit on the edge of the bed and you think, oh, another fucking day of torture. Pardon my French. If that's happening for you, then you have to rethink what you're doing. Life is not supposed to be that way. You know, if you're waking up every morning and you're hating what you're doing, then maybe there's something else that you can do. In fact, I would actually say there's definitely something you can do differently. Um, it's not over till the fat lady sings, in my opinion. So the four things I was thinking about this morning was I, when I was in grad school in Vermont, and it was cool this morning because I did some research about this, and I was reminded of why appreciative inquiry was just absolutely so top of mind for me uh, when I first got in grad school and went through grad school. So I have a master's in administration. I went to St. Michael's College in, Ver in Vermont. The, the, the master's degree that I have, it was one of the top programs in the country. And I was really blessed to be in a program with some really smart people. And in, from Green Mountain Coffee Roasters and Ben and & Jerry's and Magic Hat Brewing and the state of Vermont, um, the, like, people that were working for the state of Vermont, state workers. And they're just really blessed, okay? I also... Was, it had a great friend, and she was recently on uh, Relentless Talk Radio. Her name is Sarah Jo Willie, and she was a, a Dale Carnegie uh, instructor. So I got a chance to kind of experience all of that at the same time while I was working for a Six Sigma organization. Just got really exposed to a lot of high-level thinking. And one of the things that we really were very aware of is this idea of appreciative inquiry. So I looked it up again because I talk about it a lot, but I wanted to make sure I remembered. So David, um, David Cooper Ryder was the this, this social psychologist. He's actually a professor of social entrepreneurship in Burlington, Vermont at Champlain College, which is pretty cool. So I went to school in um, in Vermont. My graduate school experience was in Vermont. And so the reason why this was so top of mind in Vermont was because the founder of the, the movement, one of the founders, um, the other one is Shakrish, and I can't pronounce his last name. It's an Indian name. Um, he wrote a book for his dissertation um, called The Appreciative Inquiry of, or of Organizational Behavior. And that became an actual movement. And so what is appreciative inquiry? Well, there's four steps to appreciative inquiry. And the first step is, is acknowledging what is. So taking inventory. So I'm in recovery. At some point in my recovery, I took an inventory of the stuff that was happening in my life, positive and negative. I, I do that regularly. Every time I have a major change in my life, I take an inventory. I'm taking a major inventory right now, I'll tell you. Okay, COVID has brought up all th kinds of things for me to think about. So taking an inventory of re reality, both the positives and the negatives of the situation that you're in. So an idea, an idea of what life is giving you, okay? What is, are you getting out of life? Honestly, what are you getting out of life? What is that job doing for you? What is that relationship doing for you? What is that, you know, friendship doing for you? What, what is happening in your life? Just, you know, take a lay of the land. Just unabashed look at lay of the land and see what's working best. I mean, there are things that are actually working, people. I mean, everything's not horrible, okay? Um, what is working? And so when you take an inventory, you find out what is working in your life, what's working. And then you think to yourself, okay, number two, what could be? Okay, so if this thing that's working was working at its very best, what could I create? What could I envision? What, you know, really the sky is the limit, right? You just go ahead and just think about, hey, what is your best life really look like? If I had it my way, what would it look like? I, I just recently um, signed an influencer contract, you know, agreement with Buddy Stubbs. Um, and uh, 
Buddy Stubbs, an investor, and I are going to be working together this year to build our brands together and to create something really awesome together and to do that here on social media and also have events. And at the end of it, there's going to be a really awesome poker run that's going to support the LLS Leukemia Lymphoma Society because I've been nominated for Woman of the Year this time next year. So that idea came from what works for me. I love being on my motorcycle and I love being charitable and I love talking with people and I love exploring. So I created something that was based upon getting on my motorcycle and supporting the businesses around the motorcycle industry. That was inventory. I love being on my motorcycle. I love building community. I love supporting organizations that are doing great things. And so if I were to take that thing and turn it into something, what would it look like? So this year I'm going to Sturgis and it's going to be a total influencer project between me, Buddy Stubbs and my companies. Awesome, right? So what could be? And then you think about what should be, okay? So this idea of, okay, I think I'm going to get a motorcycle. I think I'm, okay, here's the idea. I go, I want to just get in there. So this week, we're sitting down um, with the marketing department for Buddy Stubbs and we're putting all the pieces together for what this is going to look like and how it's going to tie into my Choose Healthy Chains business where I'm focusing on health and fitness and how it ties into Relentless Talk Radio and how it ties in with my art and what they're doing and what's happening. And we're going to put legs on the idea, right? So I know what is, I love being on my motorcycle. What do I dream of? Riding it more often. And what am I, what, how should it be? That is just creating a step-by-step -step plan on what things look like, right? What do I got? Let's see what's happening. What can I do here? What can I do there? And then what will be? Okay, so what is your destiny, destiny and, your, and your legacy? What's going to happen? What am I going to leave behind? I imagine that this time next year, between this uh, initiative, okay, and the Micka Lizzie Gibbs project, where I'll be creating a painting that will be auctioned off at the gala next year, that I'm going to earn $50,000, for the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, and that money is going to go into a fund in my father's name. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to be building my influencer status, increasing my sponsorship, increasing my followers, increasing um, the, the opportunities to have endorsements and other types of internal sponsorships. And I'm going to be increasing people on my health and wellness team while I'm doing it because I'm going to be meeting tons of people. So I am thinking the legacy I'm going to leave behind is a giant fund for my dad in my dad's name that's going to cure dang blood cancer. I'm going to make a lot of people a lot of money, and I'm going to come out on the other side having done something that I love to the best of my ability and for the good of all. So that is, how do I come up with these ideas? Because I believe in appreciative inquiry. I believe that you look at what works in your life and you build on that. And that's how those ideas come up. And every big idea that I've had and every big success I've had has come from that place. And when I look back on Appreciative Inquiry, um, David Cooper, uh, writer, uh, became involved with the Green Mountain Coffee Roaster people. So B Bob Stiller was the CEO of Green Mountain Coffee Roasters. Now, here's a great cat. He started Easy, easy Rider rolling papers, okay? So if you're a pothead, at some point or another, you rolled a cigarette or you rolled a, pot, a joint with a Easy Rider, okay? He made a huge success out of that. He went on to Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, made a huge success out of that. And then he um, met the, the founders and the creators of Keurig, which were two guys, John Sullivan and Peter Dragon, who were out of Maine, okay? Two guys in Maine said, you know what? I think I want to make a little cup that makes it easier to have coffee in the office. And they pitched the idea to Green Mountain Coffee Roasters. Bob bought the idea, okay? And now that company has morphed into and has been bought by the third largest um, beverage company in the world, which is uh, Dr. Pepper Snapple. I am sure that John and Peter were sitting on a bar stool one day somewhere in Maine, and they said, you know what? What works? We really like coffee. We really like coffee in the office. And what could be, what if we could make something that could make coffee so much easier? Okay, and how should it be? Let's put legs on it. Let's get Green Mountain Coffee Roasters involved. Let's start, you know, tweaking it and fine tuning it and get people involved. And here's a leg, and here's a leg, and here's a part, right? And then what will be? Krurig is a multi billion dollar company. It's $18.7 billion, which is an article I, I wrote from a bit ago. So that's what Impreciative Quiry is. So, people, let me tell you something, okay? I'm not where I'm going to be, okay? I, certainly not where I used to be, but. I know where I'm going, okay? And if you don't know where you're going and you haven't taken some time to take stock of your life, okay? I'm serious, guys. Take stock of your life. 
If you're waking up every morning miserable and you don't want to go to work and you don't want to live, then you've got to change something. You've got to do something in your life to make your life worth living. Now, if you're just getting up every day and it's a ho-hum, like whatever, and you're living for the weekends, that is not life. Life is not two days a week. Life is 24-7. So take stock of your life. Figure out what is working. Okay, number one, what's working? Number two, if I were to build on that, what could be? What could be? Number three, what should it look like? What, what are the legs I need to put on it? What are the pieces I need to put in place? And what will be? What destiny and what legacy are you going to leave behind? Okay? So those are the things that I think about, and that's what drives me. And uh, some of you may have seen my um, – I'm going to go here and get a link for um, – Dan to join us. Some of you may have seen my video on my uh, private, uh, my personal page. It's always public. I don't have any personal in my life really for the most part. A couple things that are personal. It should be personal, but for the most part, I share the bigs. And uh, I, I shared a couple videos and photographs of me um, with my new motorcycle, a 2011 um, Road King that I bought uh, with Frank Stubbs the other day um, with the help of an amazing investor. And this year is gonna be really super exciting. So if you're not excited about your dang life, people, and I'm gonna go over here and, and get um, grab a hold of, of, um, of Bill. One of these days I will have studio people that will help me do this. Um, if you're not excited about your life, then you have to change something. You have to do what's necessary to be surrounded by the people that make you lift you up and make you feel good. You got to do something to be in a job that makes you feel fulfilled. It makes you feel if it's not a job, you need to go start a company and take the hit if you need to. I've taken the hit over and over and over again, but I'll tell you, every morning I wake up excited for the most part. So I'm so excited because Bill is here. I'm going to bring him on screen. Did you cut your hair? I had a cut last night. It looks flipping fantastic. Thanks. Kind of an impulse thing. I figured, you know, change. Wow. Actually. I'm like, you're super, you're super hot, dude. I'm telling you, you look awesome. Good for you. Good haircut. Well, thank, you. thank you. That's yeah. awesome. So tell everybody who you are and what you do after I just told everybody how hot you are. I mean, they, they can just look at you and see that. It's completely evident. So tell everybody who you are. My name is Peter Dragon. Is that a real name, that guy's name? Is his name Peter Dragon? Is that his name? Is his name Peter Dragon? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Peter Peter Dragon and, and John Sullivan. Was that, isn't that a cool name, Peter Dragon? It's a cool name. I remember. You know, I, I, don't you hope they got the $18.7 billion? They probably didn't. They probably, they probably ended up with a couple million. But the guys who created Kruger are two college kids from Maine. Wow. Isn't that cool? That is cool. And they went to a pothead who used to, who started Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, and the three of them made Kruerig into the multinational company that it is now. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah, that's great. I love stories like that. They just let, let you know that, you know, everything's possible. And you know what? That's all creativity, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it flows. If you're in the flow and you have gratitude, things will happen for you. That's right. So tell everybody who you are. Uh, my name is Bill Dambrova. Currently, I'm an artist and museum exhibition designer. I'm kind of flipping it in that order. For a long time, it was exhibition designer and artist. Um, since moving to Phoenix about five years ago and getting an art studio, I kind of made the decision like, all right, it's the art career is first. I got to make this happen. If it's ever going to happen, it needs to happen now. And um, just things in my life kind of were set up for me to be able to do more freelance work with uh, museums as opposed to having to work nine to five. So I've got kind of a perfect balance right now of, uh, you know, project based design work where, you know, maybe we'll work intensely for about a month and then, you know, work on uh, the project as it needs to be worked on. And then I have these big chunks of time to get in the studio and paint and we're just like binge paint and both things inform, they inform each other. You know, you know what? I know that about you. Mm -hmm. I can tell a fellow binger when I, when I see one, yeah. people will say, Michelle, how long does it take you to make a painting? I'm like, well, I don't know can take like an hour sometimes because <laughs> you, but, but the, what it took to get to that hour or that two hours or three hours or four hours, you know, I mean, how it, what it takes is just serious focus, right? Sometimes you can say, okay, it's done at night. You start at six o'clock and you're up all night and you can't stop and you wake up in the morning and you got a painting, right? Yeah. I mean, and with design, I binge because, you know, I, I just need to get it done so I can get to the next thing. Like there's this kind of need to be finished with stuff paintings as well. It's just like, I'm just craving to be done with it. So if I have a list of 15 things that need to be done that week, 
literally just go down one at a time, knock out each thing on the list. And if it means working on something for 12 hours straight to get it off the list, that's the, that's what I do. You know, it's funny when I started doing the art of fearlessly doing business, it's exactly what it did for me. Like I know when you're in grad school, you're thinking you, this is like the inspiration is going to fluffy. It's going to hit you. And then you're just going to, you know, at some point it's just going to magically happen. And that's not what happens when you're on a deadline. Right. You realize that making art professionally is not just about being fluffy and when the inspiration hits you, you have to actually produce. Yeah, pretty much. And, um, you know, I've really been, you know, taking the art seriously, like I said, for the past five years. But in the beginning, it was a lot of playing catch up. So there would be an exhibit coming up and I would have to make all the work for that deadline. And deadlines are cool. They get stuff done. But um, what I'm realizing now is being ahead of the game and having an inventory of work is much better. So, I, I mean, I'm really self motivating so i don't really need deadlines to get the work done you know i just yeah i'd way rather i mean especially with all the covid stuff happening like you get a taste of like oh this is the normal pace that humans are supposed to be uh, be working it you know not just <laughs> like i've got 10 shows coming up i've got to try to figure out i need a truck for this one to get to tucson and that was how it was right before covid a friend of mine fausto and i were talking about how are we going to get all this stuff done? We had a show coming up and then all of a sudden this hit, everything was canceled or turned into an online thing. And it was like, wow, what a relief, you know, now we have, <laughs> now we have more time to make art. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it's, I think there's a lot of people that feel that way that, you know, Hey, I was, I was running around like crazy people. I have a time with my kids. So now I've got time and I've got some time with the people in my life. So I think it's smart. So why, why make art Bill? I mean, you know, I mean, I know why I'm making it. Why do you make it? Um, well, I mean, it's an itch. I mean, it's not like it's one of those, I've got this long explanation for why I need to make it. It's just that I know that I get really angry and frustrated if I don't make something. So I think that- It's always me, been that way for you since you were a kid kid? Yeah, but it wasn't necessarily drawing or painting. Um, I can, I mean, I can remember as a kid rearranging all the knickknacks and posters and stuff in my bedroom and repainting the walls. Like I'm 10 years old, repainting the walls, just like what I'm doing now in museums. I mean, that's exactly what we do. So for yeah. me, there's not really much of a difference in terms of creativity between arranging things on a shelf or arranging things on a canvas. It's all the same to me. You know, for me, it's the same thing with business. And I the more I, I combine art and business together, the more mm -hmm. I realize, I used to think that my art brain was one side and my left brain was the other side. You know what I mean? Like they were separate, but I realized it's one and the same when you're cre I mean, I think that Kruig and Green Mountain Coffee Roasters and that story that I just told is a perfect example of creativity. Mm -hmm. They just use, you know, entrepreneurs use a different paintbrush. Yeah. You know, it's just different components. And it's funny that you say that because I'm, I'm transitioning a house right now um, a, from a, a person who passed away and, and I'm, I'm transitioning the things that are in the house and, and, kind of helping with the transition of a home. Mm -hmm. And I realize the same thing that you're doing that when I want to self soothe, I rearrange things. Yeah. I just, you know, I just went ahead and like got the books all squared away and, you know, <laughs> they're all, you know, squared and organized and, you know, went ahead and, and that, and that to me is a way to brain dump. And so in that brain dump, that's where I'll think of whatever. So to tell me what your art's about, because you're, you're, do you call yourself an abstract artist? I mean, what do you call yourself? People say, what kind of art do you make? I hate that question. Did you hate that yeah, question? I, I mean, that. I, uh, no, I don't mind the question. I kind of simplify it. It's like, if it's a person that I don't know and they just come up and say, what kind of art do you make? I say, I make big abstract paintings that are inspired by what I imagine is happening inside of our bodies. And that kind of, maybe that gives them a visual of what's, you know, what that might mean to them. Um, of course, you know, I'd rather just show a picture. So at that point I just whip out the phone and say, look, you know, and see what, <laughs> see what kind of reaction I get from them. Right. But, um, you know, it's as a, again, like I'm just trying to connect museum design and, and art together. Cause that's for me, that's, I think that's interesting for people to hear how this kind of, all this stuff kind of merged. Um, yeah. as a, as a painter, before I started working as a designer, it was all just pure abstraction, like abstract expressionist, no imagery. If there was something that started to look like an image, it, I would erase it out. And then, once I started working in museums and learning the whole process of how the exhibition comes together, there's content story. Um, it's very linear narrative and, um, educational. And I realized I really like that aspect of the, you know, 
coming up with exhibitions, ideas for exhibitions and brainstorming, you know, how the visitor is going to react to that. And so when I was working nine to five, I would come home and react to like this, you know, creating narratives and stuff all day at work by creating abstract paintings. But then as, as I was designing less and less and working nine to five less and less and freelancing more, um, I realized that the abstract paintings were starting to get more narrative and become sort of, I don't want to say educational, like I'm trying to teach anybody anything, but more like there are stories in there. There are narratives in there. I don't, necessarily need the viewer to get them like mentally I, I think like if they feel it somehow I think I'm successful but for me the whole time I'm painting now there's like there's a story involved like oh this is what this painting means now this is like if it turns into a direction like for example one an easy thing to explain was my girlfriend is a massage therapist and when she gives uh, you know pushes in here and talks about releasing toxins I visualize these knots being pushed and squeezed and squirted and colorful goo coming out and energy and all that kind of stuff. And that's what I think about when I'm making paintings. Do you think that your the work that your girlfriend does on you has inspired your painting? Yeah, I'm sure it has. Cause it's, it's like, it's weird. I think I'm, I'm kind of twofold in that way that there's a side of me that's really grounded and there's a side of me that just wants to float away into the ether. And, um, <laughs> the more and more I think about it, I think I'm painting a lot of this physical stuff because I'm trying to get my head around being in a physical body. So, you know, I'm more, I feel more, I don't know, conscious connected than I do physical connected to the earth sometimes. And I think, you know, my girlfriend being a massage therapist and like you get, you dig into the body. And um, in that regard, I think, yeah, it, uh, I'm inspired by that because she's always thinking about where pressure points are, how muscles connect, everything is connected in the body. And that's the same thing I'm thinking about. That's interesting to me. Mm -hmm. So what do you think the, the biggest thing you've learned about being an artist and a business person is? This is a conversation that, that I've had over the years and, and some artists kind of take offense to me having this conversation, but I think it's an important conversation to have because if you want to be a working artist, you are a business person. Yeah, yeah. And that business is not a dirty mm -hmm. word. However, we all kind of, I, str I struggled with it. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm a business person now and I, I became a business person in other areas, but I had a really hard time connecting business to my art myself personally. So I know I get where it comes from, but what do you think you've learned the most about being in business as an artist? Um, well, it, try not to go on too far of a tangent, but I think the reason that I was adverse to the idea of business was because it didn't feel very humble. It felt very much like, look at me, look at my art, look at what I'm doing and now buy it. And, I, you know, it's I'm sure that's like that for a lot of artists. It's like you don't really want to put a price on something that means so much to you. And you definitely don't want to push it on anybody because it's like, so you're humble. yeah, it's not necessarily being like self-conscious or something. It's more just like, you know, I understand that you may not like this and I'm not, I don't want to force you to like something you don't like, you know, right. it's very car salesman to me. But, you know, once I started making more art and the art became, I mean, you know, when I was a designer and I'd make one painting a month or one painting every three months, that thing was precious. And then once I got a studio and started making tons of work, I'm like, okay, now I got to figure out how to move this. And so I have to store it or move it. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so like thinking about it energetically, I want the work to, to be alive. I feel like when I finish a painting, it's a new life form. And I want that thing to be out in the world doing stuff. It doesn't need to necessarily be sold into a person's collection, into their home or something, but if it's hanging at a library or if it's at an airport or something like that, just to have it rotating out into the world was good enough for me for a while. And then now, um, you know, I kind of realize I'm already doing all this business stuff. I got a website, I, now I got an online shop. It's like, I can't stop there. I mean, for the longest time, it's like you think, oh, well, I got a shop and you just throw it out there. And it's like, nobody knows that it's out there. Now right. you have to do the next step, which is drive people to your website. And so now once you go down that road, you're like, oh man, now I'm marketing. Now I have a marketing department, you know? And so you either have to like make it fun. So that's what I'm, that's to answer your question. What I've learned is I got have to make it fun. I have to make it kind of silly and absurd even. So like, you know, I have a page. When I got my studio, I felt like I needed to name it. So I named it Goat Heart Studio. So I could say, 
come buy something from Godhart Studio, not come buy one of my paintings. It just it was easy for me to make that jump and disconnect the art, you know, from myself into you know it being a business. And um, you know, even that's just fun. Even the name of the studio is absurd and dorky, and it's just like it doesn't mean that it's not serious. It just means that it's like I'm trying to have fun with it and and like be have no shame going online going. I got an online shop, go, come buy stuff, you know, <laughs> whatever, and not feel, uh, yeah, just not to have any shame. There's no reason to. It's probably age, though, too. I mean, at this point, I feel like, well, it's now or never. I got nothing to lose. Uh, so. I, I I tell you, I'm, I have friends that, um, that are very attached to their appearance, you know what I mean? And so that when they're aging, they're thinking, okay, I'm wrinkling, I'm losing my hair, I'm graying, I'm, I'm whatever. I'm therefore somehow less valid or something, right? Mm. I don't yeah. know. I never, I never led with the pretty card. So to me, it's like, okay, so whatever. But to me, I actually like getting older because I feel like I've earned my seat at the table. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I don't have to apologize for who I am or whatever. I also grew up in an Irish Italian family where, you know, my aunts and my mother said, hey, this is what God gave you. Do the best you can with it every day. You know what I mean? Just show up and, and you know, put some lipstick on and you're good. You know, I just you don't have to be perfect. And, and you're, you're beautiful just for being you, you know. So I think it's interesting that the age factor, I, I, I wouldn't be a young woman again if you paid me. Because the insecurity that you have when you're younger about stupid ass stuff. I mean, that I remember getting critiqued in, in, in college and being mortified because my my photography professor gave me a, a prickly critique and I was mortified for years over that. Mm. And then I, then I, I had a show at the Walter gallery and I, and there was about 29 paintings in it. And I remember, you know, looking at the show before everybody showed up and that moment where you finally got everything, you know, like the last second, everything's hung and you look around and you go, you know what? Wow. I don't even care if people like it. Yeah. I like it. Like, I don't even care if one thing sells. It doesn't matter. I made it. It means something to me. It has value. It has life, as you said. And the fact that it's all hanging together and there'll be people seeing it, that to me was enough. If anything sold, it was an added bonus, right? So I can, I can really appreciate what you're saying. And making it fun is, I think, very important because it is scary to make art and sell it, I think. Yeah. A lot of people. Yeah. I mean, make it fun. Do your best. And just remember that, you know, I think... If you do your best and figure that, you know, it's the best that you can do for yourself, then yeah, all that other stuff doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. So we wanted to talk about a couple things you're working on. You're working at the Monterey Bay Aquarium right now and designing a museum there. You're doing it kind of remotely via COVID, which is interesting, I'm sure, yeah, right? It's super crazy. So um, one of the, well, the Monterey Bay Aquarium was what got me interested in museums in the first place. Like I was 16 years old opened up a National Geographic magazine and there was this beautiful aquarium with the kelp forest in there. It's like three stories tall. And I'm just like, I gotta go see that. So I got in the car and, you know, 16 years old, just barely got my license, drove straight to Monterey from Phoenix, 17 hours and slept in the parking lot and then went in and just had like, was in a wonderland basically. And, you know, years go by, I worked in a bunch of museums, and done the freelance stuff. And then Beth Redman Jones, who is my mentor in museums, uh, is now one of the big shots at Monterey Bay. And she sent me a link to a, a job offer that was, it was a nine to five job as a design director. And it was one of those, almost like a crisis moment where I'm just like, oh man, like this is my dream. My younger self would be really pissed off if I didn't take this position, but it would be moving to Monterey, sleepy town, uh, working nine to five, two weeks off, whatever that go back to that stuff, probably no time to make art, you know, and it would be a full on career shift. And, um, I had to just realize that, you know, I mean, aside from this other project that we're going to probably talk about in a second, then, you know, I can't leave Phoenix at the moment anyway, <laughs> which is probably a good thing. Help me make that decision. Yeah. But um, I thought, all right, well, I guess I'm just not going to be able to get that job and work at the, at the aquarium. And then a few months later, Beth, sent me an email and said, Hey, how would you like some work, some freelance work at the aquarium? And I guess before that they didn't really do a lot of freelance, their policy, she changed the policy so that I could work there. Cause you're and so fantastic. Exactly. So, <laughs> uh, so they have a, an exhibit about the deep sea that's coming up, opening up in two years now um, because of COVID it was supposed to open up in 2021 at some point. And so um, 
yeah, I just came in to um, do the design of the interior of the aquariums, the rock work. So if you can imagine like giant tanks full of sea creatures, huge crabs and stuff, I would design on the computer exactly what the interior of the tank looks like. And then the, the theming of the outside of the tank. So the, Oh my God, how the, fun. Yeah, so if you're standing in front of the tank, it feels like you're underwater in the deep sea, standing in front of a seamount looking at this stuff. And then, um, and then I got to fly up there. You know, it's like an hour and a half flight from Phoenix right. to back. And, you know, just like get to show up with my suitcase and, you know, come into a meeting and meet everybody and be part of the team instantly. And they're all amazing people. And um, we all work together really well. And then I got brought in to do some design sprints which are like kind of a reevaluation of the exhibit as it is and figure out how to, um, you know, kind of maybe update it and change it a little bit for what the world needs at this point with everything going on. So, um, so that's what we're doing in the, uh, doing the zoom meetings. They're actually WebEx meetings, but it's like 15 people that, you know, most of them I hadn't met and we're all just like in a big round table meeting together, brainstorming on, you know, how to make this exhibit cool. So that's my, one of my favorite things to do. So that's, as much as I love being an artist, I'm really not ready to let those moments go either. I think it, I think. And why do you have to? I mean, you can do both. Well, exactly. And it's I like. Mean, I think that people always say to me, Michelle, pick one thing. And I say, you know what? I don't want to. Yeah. I mean, I'm a philanthropist and an artist and an athlete and a business coach and a, and a, a biker. And I, that's what yeah. I am. Why do I have yeah. to pretend to be something I'm not? I'm yeah. all that. Right? I'm hoping. Yeah, exactly. I'm hoping that, you know, younger people now are realizing that they don't have to just pick one thing like that. But, and when I was in college, the, you know, you get the master of none uh, lecture, pick right. one thing and go with it. You couldn't even, when I was, it was like the late nineties, you couldn't, or mid nineties, you couldn't even have a, if you were an artist, you couldn't mention your day job because people would think that you weren't serious as an artist. A hundred percent. You know, you well, the other thing that happens is, and I heard in what you were saying, I found like in those moments where, you 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 want to go for the okay? I, I want to go for the job where I, I was a kid. I wanted this job. Like my kid self is going to hate me if I don't have yeah. this job. But then you realize, well, wait a minute. My life is now something different, and it's changed. And 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 that job was the dream I had when I was a kid. But my life no longer is in alignment with that. But I'm just going to let go and trust that the universe or God or whatever the heck you believe in is going to bring me the thing that's going to give me joy. And then you get a call saying, hey, do you want to freelance here? And they change the whole policy for you. Yeah. So it's like proof, like you have to stay true to yourself and the right opportunities and the right people and the right collectors are going to come to you if you keep on showing up as yourself and just trust that on the other side, you know, you're going to jump and then you're going to grow wings on the way down before you hit the floor. I mean, I, I've had to trust that over and over again. And every time I have walked into a situation where I'm like, I, I'm living in my car, I'm not sure where I'm going to eat. I don't have any cash. I'm Something happens and it gets me to the next place. Exactly. So, I mean, I think the, the moral of that story for me is just be ready. You know, when something comes, when an opportunity comes, be able to say yes confidently or no confidently. I had yeah, a, keep on building the structure behind what you're doing so that you can be ready to do what you're doing when you're doing it. Because that, that sounds like a stupid what I just said, but it's true. No, it's, it, um, Louis Pasher says, um, luck favors the, the prepared. Exactly. You know, I mean, if you, if you, and this is a guy passionate, pasteurized milk, I think it's funny that his last name was pasture. I have no idea. So uh, I thought it was something to do with pasture, like the cows in the pasture. No, it's the guy's last name. It's kind of funny how it works out that way. He couldn't make that shit up, you know? So I think that um, continuing to build your foundation, like every day, I'm not selling art. I don't know how I'm going to sell art. You got to get into the studio and make it. If you don't, let me tell you something. If you don't make it, you're never selling it. If you don't make it, you're never showing it. And you have to make it before you even know what you're making. Because if you don't start making it, you're never going to get to the point where you're seeing lights explode from your your, your shoulders when your girlfriend is giving you a, a back rub. You're never going to get to that point where the creativity is ignited enough where you can create the thing that's going to make you the amazing artist that you've become. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I love everything about what you just said. Now, you have some stuff going on at the airport. Yeah, so this was um, two years ago I got this project. It's uh, the SkyTrain stations. They have just finished the last two SkyTrain stations. The one that is at the rental car return station is uh, like the end of the line, basically. 
And so I'm not sure how many stations there are, but several artists have already done the floor. They've designed, you know, several thousand foot size floors. I, just, I can't remember the artist that did one of the floors. And I just recently well, met Daniel Diaz person. did one, Fausto did one. Um, who, who was the first person that you said? Daniel Diaz from Tucson did one. Nope. Fausto Fernandez did one. Fausto. He told me that he just did the floor. I mean, we chatted a bit back ago and uh, yeah. I was just fascinated. Totally yeah. fascinated. So you get to do one of those. How fun. Super fun. And it's cool. It's through Phoenix Office of Arts and Cultures. And the guys there, it's like they're, you know, they're selecting artists. They're, they didn't want to design, even though it's a very designed thing. It's basically like a big stained glass window on the floor. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, um, so they encouraged 2D artists to apply for this 3D spatial project, which I thought was amazing. So it was all artists. Frank Gonzalez is, yep. uh, he, He's another painter from uh, lives in uh, Mesa that uh, got the other uh, SkyTrain station that's right before mine. So, so you want to do one of those big, fantastic, wonderful, luscious paintings that you make on the floor in the airport? Yeah, I mean, the goal was to try to translate it in a way that, of course, meets budget, right? So it's like, well, so um, just that, as right. often as it would be to just directly, you know, have one of my paintings on the floor, there's a lot of things to think about. Like, it's a 3D space, and you nobody will ever see the entire floor as one thing. It's a very, it's like, as you're walking, you see it almost like an animation. You see, like, 10 feet, 15 feet. I, I am so flippin' excited about this. I can't, I'm gonna, when you, when you get done, can you PM me so I can come over and do a video of it? Because I think it's super cool that you're doing uh, it. I will. I don't it's know when cool. it's opening to the public, but um, tomorrow, actually, I'm finally able to go down there and get a look at what they've laid out so far. So it is like stained glass. Like, it's all metal work. And then in between the metal work, they basically prowl in colored, like cement with aggregate in it. So I've, I've got like 20 colors or something in there. There's glass mixed in there, abalone shell. It's just gonna sparkle. Gonna that little 10 year old boy that would take the stuff off the walls and repaint your, your, your bedroom is going, yay, how much fun. I get to like play with a bunch of stuff and reorganize it and get it to be exactly the way I want it and totally. add color and there's gonna people, I'm so excited. I can't wait to see what it looks like. That's wonderful. And you know what? I was just talking in the, in the pre-segment about leaving a legacy. Dude, mm, exactly. that's a legacy because that will be in the airport for many generations. Yep. And that is really, when I think about all the people that are going to be walking and all of their lives are going to be walking for multiple generations for many, many years over your art, it is really flipping fantastic. Most of what I do, thank you. Most of what I do is uh, semi permanent. The exhibits that I design end up coming down in a year or 10 years or something. So this will be the most permanent thing I've ever done. That's yeah. really cool. So yeah. another thing that you're doing, and we're, we've gone over, but are you okay with time? Oh, I'm fine. Um, because I really do want to hear about the installation piece that you're doing. So you explained earlier that your studio is called Go Heart Studio, but you actually share a studio with Amanda Athens, right? Atkins. Atkins. And it's um, the Cobra um, Flute Projects is what mm -hmm. you guys call the work you do together. Mm -hmm. And we were talking earlier about your desire to do more installation work uh, because it really, I've always, I'm always, I love the Whitney Museum because of the installation pieces. And I love artists like Richard Serra, where you have to walk into the, the sculpture to get the full experience, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I love that you're doing installation pieces because I don't think there's enough of that in the Phoenix market right now. So good for you for supporting that part of work because I think it's, very important for installation artists have a space to show. So tell me a little bit about the, about the show that you're thinking about. It's in October, right? Uh, we're hoping for October. Um, right. So pretty much as soon as I started thinking about what kind of shows I wanted to do in the space once we reopened, because in the past we've done five or six shows and it's, you know, pretty traditional paintings and drawings and sculpture and stuff like that in the space. And um, I just thought, man, I want to do stuff that's more immersive. Um, not necessarily wall or shelf art that's easily, you know, marketable, sellable, that kind of thing, because there are artists in town that make that kind of work and they need a place to show. So, um, you know, again, as the universe, as we know how everything is connected and works, I had a friend who contacted me, Lily Reeves, moved back from Alabama uh, to Phoenix and she does neon immersive uh, installation type work. 
And she's uh, wanting to pair up with another artist, the local artist from Phoenix, Lisa von Hoffner, and do some kind of collaborative uh, installation in the space. And so even though it's our studio space, we have everything on wheels and we can just roll it out of there and we have an instant you know, 700 square foot wide cube that people can do whatever they need to do in there. So um, I think that'll be an interesting start to the, to the program this year. Well, thank you for doing that because I think I really do, as I said earlier, think the installation work is very important um, and it gets you to really think. I love the the thought process behind installation work and how it's really uh, integrative between social practice art, which is about the community and, and engaging with the community in an interesting way that creates thought that gets you to kind of go, huh, I, lo I love that. I love it when there's the Whitney, the Whitney Biennial, I would go every year and spend like just mad amounts of time there. Uh, just admiring the the installation work. So thank you very much for doing that. Cool. So how like do people get a hold of you? Oh, how do they get a hold of me? Um, yeah. Go to my website, BillDambrova.com. There's a contact page on there. You can email me. Um, you can call me, 602-561-3242, if you have any questions or anything about it. Say that again a little slower. 602-561-3242. Awesome. Well, mm -hmm. Bill, I'm... I'm super excited. We got a chance to chat. We've been we've 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 kind of had opportunities uh, briefly at our first um, Fridays or at a gala or something, and and I've always wanted to get to know you better. I'm really impressed with you as a human being. I've always you know you you meet somebody, you get like a good feeling from them. I've always felt that way about you. Oh, and and it's, it's the truth. And I think I think that's what you you give to a lot of people, and you bring that strong, um, confident, uh, caring element and a male caring element to the arts community here in, in Phoenix. And I, I really appreciate that about you and you're very brave and I appreciate that. So thank you very much for the work that you do, you know, at the museums for the legacy that you're leaving at the airport and for the, for what you do for the arts community here in Phoenix, because you really are a leader in the arts community. You're, you're very pro artists. Um, you're highly respected and thank you very much for taking time. Yeah, thanks. Really appreciate you having me on here. So thanks very much, and we will see you again soon at the next uh, First Friday Art Walk. All right, bye. All right, bye. Okay, there you guys, it's episode 72 has been a wrap. I really have appreciated speaking with Bill D'Ambrova. I'll be back again next week with um, another two guests, and I, of course I've got them in the gate, and I should have looked before I uh, came to a close. But I have two awesome guests coming up next week, so we'll be back to the 2.30 time frame. And uh, we... We'll see you next week for episode 73 of Relentless Talk Radio. Uh, this was interview, I don't know, 253 since I started this whole gig. So I hope everybody's doing well today and staying safe. And uh, if you go out and you're older and you've got pre-existing conditions, please do wear a mask and, mask, mask and be careful, okay? All right, everybody, have a good day. Take care.